How are we doing? So, we are in the middle of our series, in the GOAT sermon of all time, the sermon of Jesus called the Sermon on the Mount. Remember what we're talking about is this one sentence that we're kind of navigating through is that the kind of people we are is more important than the kind of place we live in. So as we prepare to go into uh, the fall and with the election, all these different things, what should our focus be as the people of God? Remember, it's this. It's the kind of people we are is more important than the kind of place we live in. Therefore, our focus is being a kind of people who live Jesus' kind of way, no matter what kind of country or system we live in. This is our focus. This is the focus of Jesus. Uh, so uh, I have a very encouraging sermon for you this morning entitled, How Bad Is It? Now, how many of you like the good news first? You say, I got good news or bad news. You want good news first? No. How many of you want the bad news first? Okay, you want the bad news first. Well, I have some really bad news for you this morning. Okay, I also have some really good news for you this morning. Now, some of us avoid bad news. It's like me right now. My back tooth has been hurting for a couple weeks now. So much so that I can only chew on one side of my mouth. However, I have yet to make a dentist appointment. Why is that? Well, I don't really want to know the answer to the question, how bad is it? I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Eventually, I'm going to need to know. I, I, can, only, I can only chew on one side for so long. But I avoid it. Why? Well, I don't really want to know. How bad is it? How much money will it cost me? You know, how much, how painful will that dentist visit be? I don't really want to know. I don't, how bad is it is the question I'm avoiding. Well, this can honestly be true for us, so much so in our lives. Uh, how bad is it? What's really going on? These are things that we prefer to avoid. Now, the issue is good news is really good news only after bad news, right? So if you get a bad diagnosis and you think all is terrible and then all of a sudden something happens, you get a good diagnosis, the good diagnosis feels great. If your body was healthy and somebody came in and said, your body's healthy, you'd be like, cool. But if your body was very unhealthy and dangerous and somebody came in and said, hey, your body's healthy, well, you know, if you think your team's gonna lose the game and then miraculously they win the game, this is good news. It, it comes as better news. Well, this is what I want you to understand this morning is first, we got to deal with the bad news so that the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done can actually be received as good news. And the issue for many of us is that we haven't even been able to receive the good news of Jesus because we haven't faced up with the bad news of who we really are, what's really going on. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So go ahead and open your Bible to Matthew chapter 5. Let's go. Okay. Now, I need you to pray for me real quick because we have 31 verses. Yeah, yeah. It's long, okay? I told you. Remember, okay? Bible Project, I'm, rep I'm, I'm recommending that. Every few verses deserves a sermon, literally. And if we weren't doing this in 10 weeks, that's what I would do. But because of what we're doing and trying to get through sermon and give an overview, I want to... I want to give you the thrust, the emphasis of what's being said, as opposed to getting through every detail. You can find out more if you go to Bible Project. I just highly recommend it uh, so you can get the details of this. But we're going we're gonna to try to shoot at the whole thing, and I'm going to try to go through 31 verses in a normal sermon time, all right? So I need a prayers for a miracle. Okay, the first thing we're going to start at is verse 17, and Jesus is going to set up this whole sermon about, about who you are and your behavior, okay? But he's going to set it up this way, and I'm going to explain it, but I'm going to read it first. Jesus says, okay, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of these, one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm going to stop there real quick. You're probably like, what in the world is he talking about? Now, remember, 
He's talking. He's the Sermon on the Mount. We're already through 16 verses. He's, he's preaching to his disciples in the context of a crowd, which means he's talking both to people who are following him, want to learn more, and he's talking to people who are curious about what is this Jesus fella. So wherever you are on that spectrum this morning, Jesus is talking to you in one way or another. Now, he's about to explain how the Old Testament rules and commands applied to modern people. He's about to do that, which would be very helpful for you and me. Because during that time when Jesus was there, there was a ton of arguments about how do we use the Old Testament? How does it apply? How do the commands of God work? And tons of people had different opinions. So Jesus shows up as a rabbi, and as a, because he's a rabbi, he's a teacher of the law, he shows up and he has an opinion about how do we apply the Old Testament to modern people. That's what he's going to help them understand. But as he does that, he's going to basically teach us about ourselves, our nature, and what really is going on in our lives. So Jesus shows up in a crowd of people offering different perspectives, and he gives his own. This is what he's doing. Lots of people are doing this. Jesus is giving his perspective. Now, he is God himself, as we'll come to learn. And so God comes down and is explaining what God thinks. It's very helpful to us, so we know. We know. But theologically, I need to give you a couple things, and then we're going to get into what Jesus has to say about your life and your heart. The first thing you need to understand what he's setting up is that Jesus completes, not deletes, the Old Testament. Just as a theological thing for you to understand. When he says, I have come, right, and to fulfill, not to abolish the law. So when you just think about the Bible, Jesus comes as a continuation of the teaching of the Old Testament and as a fuller revelation, not as something different. Okay? So Jesus shows up and he says, everything the Old Testament has told you about and that God has revealed, now in me, all of that is going to be fulfilled. And I'm going to complete. There's lots of meanings to this, but in the sense of the prophecies, there's over 300 prophecies Jesus fulfills in the New Testament in his life that have been prophesied in the Old Testament. He also comes, and what we're going to see is he fulfills what the Old Testament required. So every way in which we fall short, Jesus shows up. This is the gospel. Why does Jesus come to earth? Not just to die, but to live the life you and I were supposed to live. That's what he comes to do. When you talk about the word fulfill, you can flip it and to help you understand as fill full. So he comes to fill it to the full. He comes to take what has been left half empty and fill it to the brim. This is what Jesus is doing. He fulfills the Old Testament law. He fulfills the prophecies. He fulfills the moral commandments. He fulfills everything. So in Jesus now, we have the, not only the continuation, it's a completion, not a deletion. You have to understand this in terms of how Jesus is going to navigate what God has said in the Old Testament, how he reveals that. That's why he says... Not an iota or a dot will pass away. An iota or a dot are like these little scribble marks in Hebrew that could change a word just by a little accent mark. He's saying every little detail matters, is what he's saying, about the Bible and about the Old Testament. And not a single bit of it will pass away until it is fulfilled. Now, theologically, what we're going to learn is Jesus comes and he accomplishes many of this now in his life. And then he's going to accomplish the rest of it at his second coming. So Jesus fulfills all of these things. Now... What you got to understand what he's about to do then is he's about to say, okay, all this is about me is fulfilled in me. And then he's going to preach a message about how it applies. What does the Old Testament have to say to a modern hearer? And I want you to understand Jesus' message because this, you got to receive it like it is, okay? It's like a, when Jesus is about to talk, it's like, a, like when you put those blood pressure things on, you know, on your arm and it squeezes tighter and tighter and tighter until it feels like your arm's about to pop off, you know? That's the message. So just to encourage you this morning, he's about to put you in a chokehold, okay? A big one. And as soon as you think you're let loose, it's going to get tighter, okay? I just want to prepare you ahead of time, all right? Now, there is good news, but you have to receive the bad news first. So Jesus is going to say, look at this. Okay, verse 20, he says, Unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees were the most religious people. They were seen as the standard. So it would have been an impossibility to the regular person to think they could be more righteous than them. Which is why at the end, we're going to see in verse 48, he says, you must be perfect. The, whole, the message that Jesus is about to give concludes with the idea that you have to be perfect. 
you think, well, that's a problem. I don't know how many of you walked in here perfect this morning, but Jesus expects you to be perfect. So good luck. You think, I'm doing all right. Are you perfect? That's what he's about to get at, okay? Now, I just got, you got to see the gravity of what he's doing. So you got to be better than the scribes and the Pharisees, which, and then he has, you got to be perfect, basically. You got to be perfect. And get this, the consequences, as we're going to read through, the consequences for not being perfect are, Jesus says specifically, hell, or he describes it as not entering the kingdom of heaven. I'm just going to give you the weight of what Jesus is saying. You got to be perfect, and if you're not, the, the, the consequence of not being perfect is being separated from God, being punished. So, well, that sounds very serious. It is, okay? That sounds unfair. Well, I'm going to talk to you about it. But this is what Jesus, this is what Jesus said. I'm just going to give you the message of Jesus, okay? This is not the message of Nate Crew. I'm going to say what Jesus said. Now, I'm just going to make comments on Jesus' whole message, okay? But this is a serious. You got to be perfect. And if you're not perfect, the consequences of not being perfect are eternal punishment. Okay, that's how serious he's going to say. Now, the next thing he's going to help us see, and this is, what, this is the heart of it, you could write this one down, is that your attitudes matter to God as much as your actions do. Your attitudes matter to God as much as your actions do. And God cares about your heart. He cares about your heart. And what he's going to expose by his message is the condition of your heart. He's not going to expose what you're doing and that you've been committing all these terrible, obvious sins. He's going to expose, especially to those who think they're doing okay, the condition of the heart. God cares about your attitude as much as your actions. So Jesus' sermon has six subjects, anger, lust, divorce, oaths, retaliation, and love. These are his six subjects of his sermon. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to squeeze them together into three things, three categories, two by two by two, okay? Like Noah and the ark, okay? We're going in two by two. And I'm going to summarize these as these three things, controlling your desires, keeping your promises, caring for your enemies. That's his sermon, how, controlling your desires, keeping your promises, caring for your enemies. Now, what we're going to see in this sermon is there's a tension because as he preaches, he's going to tell you both this is a guide for how you ought to live, which we should still follow. But it's not only a guide, it's a standard, it's a measuring stick that shows you how short you fall. So it's like those little measuring sticks at roller coaster rides, you know, or water parks. You got to be tall enough to ride the ride, okay? Well, you got to be this tall to get into heaven, you know, that's what he's going to say. You got to be so tall, you know, and you're going to say, well, I'm not that tall. That's what he's going to do. So there's these two things that are happening that I've just been praying the Lord would help you get. Is that you ought to have a sense of a recognition that I'm not as tall. I don't measure up. That's what Jesus wants to do. Which will lead you to the cross and receiving what he's done for you. And at the same time then, you need to recognize you don't measure up. You need to trust in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But then as a follower of Christ, you need to pursue being the things that you weren't. So it's both a guide, how you should live. I still need to try to live this way. But it's also a measuring stick to say, well, you're not good enough. And both those things need to be realized, okay? So I, I have this little sentence. This is really the main thing I want you to, to know about what Jesus is going to try to say. Because I'm going to preach his sermon and I'm going to throw in some other understandings from the rest of the New Testament to help us realize the solution to the sermon, which he doesn't give in this sermon. The sentence is this. This is how, this is how the sermon goes. This is how the Bible goes, really, is that you should be, but you're not. Jesus is, so you can be too. This is the message of the gospel. You should be, but you're not. Jesus is, so you can be too. All right, so let's get into it now. So the first category is controlling your desires. It's about the heart. This one's going to mess you up real good. So I just want to prepare you for how bad you're about to feel about yourself. Okay, controlling your desires. He starts with anger. And he has this way of talking where he says, you've heard it said, but I say to you. So he's going to say, this is what the Old Testament said. Now here's how I'm explaining that to you. You've heard it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. And everybody there is nodding their head. Yeah, yeah. Shouldn't murder. It's bad. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother 
is also liable to judgment. Oh. Here's the chokehold. And whoever insults his brother will be liable to counsel. And get this. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to what? The hell of fire. What? This is what you should be. Wait, what? What did you just say? Yeah, murderers, bad. Yeah, you know, how could you murder someone? They deserve judgment. And Jesus is like, they do. But if you've ever hated someone in your heart, you're guilty of the same heart condition. This is what he's going to get at. And if you've ever called someone an idiot, you deserve to go to hell. That's what it says. Don't get mad at me. I'm just the messenger. It's right there, is it not? Everybody nod with me. It's right there in the Bible. Okay. It's right there out of the mouth of Jesus. Why is he saying this? Now, obviously, what he's not doing is equivocating murder with calling someone a fool in the sense of the fact that they're exactly the same. Of course not. Of course not. They don't have the same earthly consequences, and there is some measure of self-control to just call someone a fool and not make it worse than that. But what he's trying to get at is the condition of the heart that murder that leads to murder or that leads to calling someone an idiot is the same. The condition of the heart is anger or hatred or a better word here might be contempt. So to call someone a fool is to have contempt for them and it's to treat them as worthless. That's what you're really saying. It's to say you have no value, you're an idiot. To murder someone is to say you have no value and then to, to execute the idea that you have no value. You're doing, it's the same heart to say, you're worthless, you're an idiot, you have no value, I hold you in contempt. And the heart manifests in murder, which is obviously worse, but it also manifests in anger and in words. Now both situations are worthy of judgment before God under the law. And so he's saying, you're in a tough position. Now, what Jesus really does to mess with people is he says, look, if you murder someone, you're liable to judgment. Talking about like being judged on earth, like going to court, being put into prison. You say, yeah. And he actually, he inverts this. He takes the, what we would call the least thing, calling someone an idiot, and he gives it the greatest punishment. So he says, you murder someone, you go to jail. You call someone an idiot, you go to hell. What in the world? He's trying to make the point, not once again that they're the same, but that something is true about your heart that's really problematic. And that if God is really holy, calling someone God made an idiot is talking to God like he's an idiot because he made them. So when I devalue the existence of another human being with just my words, I'm basically saying that to God who made them. He takes it personally. It was God's choice to put that person on earth, not yours. Psalm 139 says that they are fearfully and wonderfully made. And so now God is saying, listen, there's something wrong in your heart it's anger. There's anger and hatred in your heart. It leads you to be mad at someone. It leads you to call someone an idiot. It leads you to hold. Hang on. Now, now the question now becomes, you don't say, well, I haven't murdered anybody. I'm good. No, he says, well, have you ever been angry? That's the standard. What's the measuring stick? It's not, can I control myself enough to not hurt someone, which you can do without God? It's, it, is my heart completely pure in my motives towards people? And you realize, man. Uh, so what are you supposed to do? He says, okay, look. So if you're offering your gift at the altar, this is his continued sermon now, and you remember that your brother has something against you, you need to leave your gift before the altar and go. Be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard. You'll be put in prison. Now, truly, I say to you, you'll never get out till you've paid the last penny. Look what he's saying. Hey, hey, look, this is very important because you're in a religious service right now in activity. He says, look, 
don't go offer some sort of sacrifice or perform some sort of religious ritual to God when you have a relational strife with a brother. He's saying God would prefer that you make it right in your relationships than you come pretend to be right with God. That's what he would prefer, that you be right in your relationships. It's relationships over ritual. He's saying, what should I do if I have offended or been harmful or been angry or been hateful or have said things I shouldn't say or who have acted out of malice or treated someone with contempt? He says, if there's anyone on planet Earth that can hold that against you, the main priority of your life is to go make it right. I don't care how many times you go to church if you won't make that right. It's a hard thing. And the question then becomes, man, who do you need to make things right with? One of my favorite verses, Romans 12, 18, it says, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all people. Listen, as far as it depends on you, which means you need to do everything you can do. Sometimes people won't receive it. Sometimes they won't forgive you. Sometimes they won't. Sometimes they'll keep the division. But you are responsible to do everything you could possibly do to be in right relationship with other people. Which means also during this election season that the mark of a Christian group of people should be peacemakers. That we are the relational resolvers. This is what we ought to bring to the world. This is why God calls us salt and light. Okay, I got to move faster than this. Okay, so anger. Everybody feeling good? Are you feeling good? Great. It's a problem. You got anger in your heart. Okay, here's another one. Controlling your desires. Lust. This is the next topic. Lust. He said, okay, next thing. You've heard that it was said you shouldn't commit adultery. You know, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Adultery is bad. Shouldn't do that. But I say to you. Oh, shoot. Here we go. You know, you start to get like, oh, (laughs) what's next? That everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery in his heart. Everyone's like, shoot, you know, like, how bad do you want me to feel about myself? And this goes both ways. This example is man versus woman. I think probably because men have that problem on a greater level, more consistently, but obviously it goes both ways. To say if any human lusts after another human in their heart, uh, to, to look with lustful intent, uh, the, the way you can play that out is to look too long, is to gaze, to stare, to think, to imagine, is to let your mind wander to things that you shouldn't. This person who does that, the Bible says, is guilty of adultery before God. Now, once again, he's not equivocating. Better to have the thought and not act on it than to have the thought and then go act on it. Say, well, I already had the thought. I might as well do it. Okay, that's when you're abusing what the Bible says. It's not what he says at all. He's not equivocating. He's not saying, well, it's just the same. He's saying they both deserve judgment is what he's saying. And he's getting at the heart to say the heart that goes and commits adultery and the heart that imagines about adultery or lust in their head are the same heart. It's the same heart. Just some people have more self-control than others. And maybe that might even be personality, not Holy Spirit. You just happen to be someone who's not able or willing to take it that far, too afraid or whatever it might be. It's not necessarily godly that you haven't gone to that level. So he's saying, it's your heart. Your heart is the problem. Your heart is lustful. Your heart is adulterous. This is why 2 Peter 2.14 describes some people that it says they have eyes full of adultery. Just wherever they look and however they think. Now, so to think, to lust is to be guilty under the law of God of adultery. It's to have an adulterous heart. Once again, it's about the heart. It's not just about whether you can control your hands or your feet. It's about the heart. Now, what is his solution? Well, he says you should cut off your hand and poke out your eye. Now, does he really mean that? Well, of course not. It's an example. If you cut out one eye and tore off your hand, you could still lust plenty. That wouldn't stop you from lusting. It's the heart that's the problem. So what is he saying? He's saying, take extreme measures to do everything you can to cut out and remove this sin from your life because it's destroying you. 
So the two examples here, are, it's what's on the inside that counts, you know? It's like a box of chocolates, like a jelly donut, you know? It's what's on the inside that counts. It's what you really need to be aware of. And so, if you feel good enough about yourself right now, okay, here we go. This is the gospel, though, right? Once again, it's not good news unless the bad news is bad. And you're way worse than you think. So am I. And so this is how it goes. You should be. But you're not. Jesus is. So you can be too. Let me give you a verse now. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Get this. But one who in every respect, with both, you know, lust, anger, all these, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Thank you, Lord. Look at verse 16. So, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. So you say, man, if I'm being honest, I have a murderous and adulterous heart. That's bad news because it's worthy of punishment before God. This is the situation I'm in. I'm not what I should be. Now, the good news is that Jesus came and was tempted with both lust and anger and never sinned. And he did that, look at verse 16, so that I can approach him and find help. So you should be in a position to say, I need help. And Jesus is in the position to say, I can help you. That's the good news of the gospel. It's not good news if you think you're just sort of a bad person or you're not as bad as someone else. It's not very good news. If you think, well, I haven't killed anyone or I haven't done these awful things some people do. It's, eh, that's not such good news. But it's really good news when you realize how bad things really are and how good Jesus has been. So the next thing, we'll keep it moving. The next category is keeping your promises. His two examples are about divorce and oaths. We're going to move quickly through this one. He says, okay, now it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. So this was a rule that was made in the Moses in time of Moses. He says, but I say to you, everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. Whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, oh boy, you could preach 10 sermons about marriage and trying to figure this out, okay? I got about two minutes now, right now, to get through this part. All I want to do is to say, first of all, the Old Testament permission, he says here, that you may give your wife a certificate of divorce was for a specific instance and had become abused over time, so much so that I was reading in different commentaries, people would divorce their wives because they burned their breakfast, <laughs> which isn't even funny, but just sounds so ridiculous, you know? It was just getting, you know, it was whatever. It's what it is now. We have irrecyclable, how do you say it? Irrecyclable ir differences. I don't know why I can't say it right now. <laughs> I'm a preacher, I can't talk. Okay, you have differences, okay? You have differences things you can't work out okay you don't like how he smells you know whatever it might be so they're just treating marriage with contempt basically like light and Jesus is coming along saying no 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 marriage is important and you should do everything you can to keep your covenant it's an emphasis of keeping your promises now he does give an exception in the sense well if someone commits sexual immorality they, they have broken the covenant that is there between you two and he gives some examples. Listen, man, I, I don't even want to get lost on this. But because there's a lot of divorce and remarriage, people have questions. You see in 1 Corinthians 7, he gives another example of an out, like if you're married to an unbeliever and they leave you. So a lot of times Christians had used these three words as legitimate reasons for divorce, uh, uh, adultery, abuse, and abandonment. So like legitimate, huge breaks of covenant then those become times where it's reasonable in the Bible. And also there's many examples where people have chosen to forgive and continue, you know, if there's real repentance. But it, the, the teaching of the Bible is in extreme circumstances and a breaking of the covenant through awful behavior, there is the potential for this. But on the regular normal, you know, it, your, your high degree should be on keeping your covenant. 
to keep your promises, to not so quickly move out. And this is why he's going to say the next thing he says, okay? So divorce is an example of how lightly people are taking their word, how, how they don't keep their promises, and how this is a problem. And so he gets into, oh, so then he says, again, so it's the same flow of thought. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. This is before they had hair dye, you know, before they did that. He's saying you can't create it that way. You might be able to change it now. Though. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Get this. Anything more than this is evil. You think, oh, it's not a big deal. He says, if you, anything more than just yes and no, and keeping your yes or keeping your no, anything other than that, it isn't like, oh, well, you know, you know whatever. It's evil, he calls it. To say, this is bad. Our version of this, I think these two are probably pretty applicable. When we say things like, I swear to God, or things like, I swear on my mom's life, you know, we just pick something we love. We say, I swear to the high heavens, this is true. Now, I read this, I'm going to read this quote from a commentary. It says, having to swear or make oaths betrays the weakness of your word. It demonstrates that there is not enough weight in your own character to confirm your words. He said, like, you know, I just been knocked out. How many blows can I take this morning? You know, he said, I came to church to be encouraged. Well, just wait till the end, okay? You'll be all right. If you get right with God, you'll be all right. Now, a matter of fact, if you don't, you're not okay, okay? You should feel very bad. All right. He said, I saw, you know, the idea is that followers of Jesus, what kind of people should we be? We should live with such integrity that a simple yes or a simple no is more than enough for everyone to believe us. That should be the standard of our life. I don't have to exaggerate. I don't have to do use hyperbole. I don't have to talk extreme. I don't have to swear on anyone's life or grave. If I say yes, I live in such a way, you receive my yes. If I say no, I live in such a way, you receive my no. And my life has integrity and it always backs it up. A simple yes or a simple no and remember what Jesus said, anything more than that is evil. Why is it evil? Well, it betrays a lack of integrity. Why? Well, there's an issue in the heart. Once again, it's about what's on the inside. So we fall short in controlling our desires with anger and lust. We also fall short in keeping our word. Divorce being an example. And also just the way you talk. Make your promises. But once again, here we go. You should be but you're not. So that's bad. But Jesus is. Because he is, you can be too. Let me give you another example from the scriptures about this. 2 Corinthians 1, 19 through 20 says, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, get this, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. Get this, for all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why through him we can utter our amen to God for his glory. Meaning that we may be yes and no, wishy-washy. We need to exaggerate to make people believe us. But in Christ Jesus, it has been proven that when God says yes, he means yes always. And he doesn't need to exaggerate. Why? Because he's proven his yes by the blood of Jesus on the cross. God doesn't have to use hyperbole. He uses the blood and body of Jesus. This is the evidence of God's yes. And in Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus is the ultimate promise keeper. He's the ultimate representation of God's yes and no. The ultimate representation of God's faithfulness to his word. The ultimate representation of God's reliability and perfect integrity. And though you and I may be wishy-washy, you and I may be unfaithful, you and I may be uncommitted, you and I may back out of ways people need us, you and I do not come through, you and I lie about our commitments, but Christ Jesus is always faithful faithful. This is the good news. You should be, but you're not. Jesus is, so you can be too, if you would turn to him. Okay, the last one, caring for your enemies. You have two more categories. 
retaliation and love. Get this, verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Oh boy. He's just, he's just going to take the way they think about life and turn it completely upside down. He's going to say, hey, look, you thought it was this one way, but I'm going to teach you a way. And we've talked about this before because it's already been something he's mentioned in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to give you a way to live, a type of people that surrender their rights on earth because they hold rights in the kingdom. This weird, radical, generous kind of people. The kind of people who give more than is required. The kind of people who do not retaliate. Now, I got to explain this for a second. So the original law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, was a law in the Old Testament that was given to prevent unnecessary retribution. Meaning that it was a law that things needed to be evened out. And if somebody took your eye, you couldn't kill them, you know is to prevent unnecessary retribution in particular instances of crime. Now, what, what happened is they took this principle and they just began to apply it to life and relationships as if we should just treat everybody this way all the time. And Jesus shows up and says, no, 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 that was not the intent at all. He says, not only should you limit your revenge and retribution but you should be willing to accept certain, certain things happening to you without responding at all. Now, Jesus gives us this example in 1 Peter 2, which I will read in a minute. But I want to show you how radical, he means it to be as radical as it is. But it's also, once again, has some, some nuance to it. Back then, if someone were to slap you, it's not that you say, well, if someone's just beating you up, that you just say, please beat me up some more. That's not it, okay? Let's not be dumb about this. Let's not just be so trite and say, well, Jesus being ridiculous. No. The idea of someone slapping you was that they insulted you. It's an insult. You're a dummy, you know? And if they insult you as saying, hey, don't retaliate or even resent them, okay? You don't have to respond to that. He, Jesus wants to show us and give us a heart that doesn't live with resent, anger, or contempt. A heart that doesn't have to even things out or get back a heart that is free and a heart that leaves the justice in God's hands. A free kind of person who doesn't have to retaliate. Now, there's a lot of discussion. Once again, this could be a whole sermon about war, nonviolence, uh, when is it appropriate for a Christian to give self-defense, all these things. And I want to affirm, Jesus is not against judgment or retribution. Jesus is actually the arbiter of the great judgment. He will be the judge of all people. Everything that has ever been done, Jesus will judge and he will punish severely outside of Christ. So Jesus is not against judgment, nor is he against retribution. This is why Romans 13 teaches that the God has given the government to restrain and punish evil. So the government exists, is supposed to restrain evil and punish evil. So he's not against retribution. He's not against judgment. As a matter of fact, Paul appeals to his rights often in Acts as a Roman citizen to help get him out of trouble. So it's not just a complete wash to say we should never use these things to your advantage or no one should ever be punished for the evil that they've done to you. That's not at all what he's saying. But he's saying we ought to be the kind of people that are so free and so trusting of God's ultimate judgment and so gracious and generous that we can be radical in this world and respond to hate with love. This is the message that he's going to continue in just a minute. This is why Romans 12, 21 says, do not be overcome by evil, but what's the alternative? Overcome evil with good. Well, this is where we get the phrase, go the extra mile. So Romans had a right, Roman soldiers had a right under any, for any Jew to find them and make them walk a mile with their bag. It was a rule that they had. So Jews were under Roman occupation Anytime a Roman wanted to do that, they could. Obviously, that would make you resentful, bitter, angry, which many were. That's why we, that's why we were called zealots, people who tried to rise up and mutinize against the Roman leadership. 
They were angry. They were resentful. They were bitter. Romans could do whatever they wanted. And Jesus says, listen, here's the way out. Instead of trying to create an uprising or instead of letting your heart be so angry and bitter, when they ask you to go one, go two, and you're going to find that your heart will go free. When we refuse to let our heart be bitter and resentful, and when we give more than it is asked, that is actually the thing that sets our heart free from the anger and resentment that we have in the first place. Jesus is unlocking the solution for us. He's also showing us how we ought to live. So he continues this, this way of thinking with this last one. Here we go, and this will close us up. He says, listen, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Okay, that sounds pretty normal. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now get this. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles, or what he means is people who don't know God, don't they do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So Jesus wants us to move not only from non-retaliation, but to proactive love. The standard for the way we ought to live is not just to not retaliate, but to live in proactive love. To not just not hate her, you say, okay, I cannot act in hate towards my, I can control myself enough. I hate them in my heart, but I can control myself enough not to hate them with my hands or my, my feet or to do anything to them. And therefore we think we're good. And then Jesus shows up and says, well, the hatred in your heart is just as bad. And as a matter of fact, the standard for the kingdom of God is not only that you wouldn't hate them and not only that you wouldn't act in hatred towards them, but that you would go so far as to proactively love them that you would go so far as to proactively surrender your life for people who hate you, which is exactly what Jesus did. He's saying, if you're going to follow in my footsteps as Jesus, what you're going to have to learn to do is not only love your enemies from your heart, but be willing to lay down your life, to surrender your rights, and to sacrifice your well-being for the sake of people who despise you and wouldn't appreciate it. That's the standard. It's not, have you not murdered? Have you not committed adultery? Have you not acted some of these things out? And it's not only, well, your heart's not good either. It's that, have you proactively been so countercultural that you show radical, generous love to people who hate you when you do it? That's what it means to live like God lives. And if you're not doing that, you miss the mark. That's why he says, that's why the summary of his sermon is after all this, what's the conclusion? You must be perfect. You must be perfect. And you did not walk into this room perfect. And you're not watching online perfect. And you can't go to church enough to be perfect. And you can't give enough away to be perfect. And you can't live a certain life to be perfect. You cannot. Which is exactly why we keep saying this. This is the message. You should be, but you're not. Jesus is, so you can be too. This is 1 Peter. Let me read you this. And I have two more verses for you and we're going to close. He says, for to this you have been called. So he's talking to Christians. Man, come on now. And especially as we enter into the election season and everybody just hates everybody. We have to be the exact opposite of that. Okay? You got to go out into the world and show self-sacrificial, generous love to people who despise you. And that's how you're going to be salt and light in the world. So he says, for this you have been called. Because Christ also suffered for you. Get this. Leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Okay, so what's the example Christ left for me? What did he do that I'm supposed to do as a Christ follower? Okay, here we go. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. But when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. 
He did not retaliate. When he suffered, he did not threaten what he'd do instead. But he continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on that tree. Why? That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And here's the good news. By his wounds, you have been healed. This is the good news of the gospel that you can't receive if you're not willing to accept the bad news of how bad you really are. And not only is that true, and some of you need to put your faith in Christ. You've been playing church. You've been playing religion. You can fool yourself into thinking you're doing better than you're not, and you're not perfect. And the punishment for not being perfect is hell. And if you don't have Jesus, you will be under the wrath of God. But Jesus came. He lived a life that you should have lived. He died the death that you deserve. He rose from the dead. And then if you put your faith in him, you can go from being God's enemy to being God's child. This is the good news of the gospel. You're worse than you think, but Jesus is better than you ever imagined. And not only is that true for those of you who need Jesus this morning, the solution he explains to us in 2 Corinthians 5, 21 is this. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. If you came into this room or are listening online, God wants to trade places with you this morning. He wants to take your sin, all of it, sin of the heart, the sin of the eyes, the sin of your actions, the sin of your words. He wants to take it all and nail it to the cross. And then he wants to take your messy life and give you his perfect life instead. He wants to make a trade with you this morning, best trade you ever make. This is the solution to your problem, is not to get better or try harder, is to trust in Jesus. For those of you that do know God, this sentence applies, as we've been saying the whole time, you should be, but you're not. Jesus is, that's where you've recognized that. You've come to know Christ. I should be, I'm not, Jesus is for me, so I put my trust in him. Don't miss this last part, then you can be too. So not only is a measuring stick say, well, I'm not tall enough, of course you're not. But it's a guide now, as to how you should live. And we say the kind of people we are matters more than the kind of place we live. Then these very particular sermon, the sermon here, gives you a good example of the kind of person you ought to be so that you can represent Jesus well in life and especially in this season. So God has a word for all of you this morning, all of us, to turn to Christ and to follow his example. Let's pray and we're gonna respond to God now. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your love. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you that though we are sinners, real ones, worse than we ever imagined, we thank you that your love and your cross is even more powerful than we ever imagined. I just pray now that you would produce results only the Holy Spirit can do, that you would bring real conviction, that there would be real sorrow and weeping and trouble over sin. That no one under the sound of my voice would be fooled into thinking that they're doing okay. They're not. I pray that there would be a genuine sense of how short we fall. And then I also pray that there would be a genuine turning to you. And that you would lift us up. And that you would forgive sins. And that you would turn lives around. And that you would empower us to go live in the example you set for us. I pray, Lord, that Jesus would be exalted through the forgiveness of sins and the change of lives. And I pray, Lord, for all of us that we would leave from here and go live radical lives like Jesus did to go be salt and light in the world around us. We ask that you would move now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once you go ahead.